Our saga from the book of the books of Samuel continues today, our story of David. But to drop into the text today requires just a slight amount of backstory. You might remember that, that David was anointed king over Israel in place of Saul, who wasn't a very skilled king. David anointed because he was a shepherd and knew how to care for people. David anointed because he was connected to God in a very deep and meaningful way that meant he was really equipped to lead God's people. Well, in the story before the one we have today, David seems to have sort of lost sight of all of that. He seems to have just abdicated his responsibility and lost his connection to God, something there's a slippage. And so David sends his military out to do battle, but he stays home, which is irresponsible. And while home, he's taking a lovely afternoon stroll and sees a woman who he shouldn't see, decides that that's for him, so forgets her humanity entirely, sins for her, has her, sends her back, thinks about not the consequences. Consequences arrive in the form of a, a baby that's going to be had. And David thinks, no one, can, no one needs to know about this. So, interestingly enough, her husband's off fighting the battle, where David is supposed to be, right? He comes back, David tries to get him to go to his house so that it all can look like, you know, not David's involvement, and it doesn't work. And so David, as a last resort, sends her husband back to the battle lines and has him killed. Makes it look like it was just a military, you know, casualty, but David engineers the whole thing. And so then we come to our story today. And David, he thinks he's gotten away with murder. And he takes Bathsheba, the woman, into his home. And OK, great. Months go by. One day, Nathan, who's the prophet, the prophet, if you will, on David's cabinet, comes in with a message. And David isn't the wiser because, well, it's been months. And he thinks nobody saw what happened, but kind of forgot that, well, the Holy One sees all that happens. And so Nathan, as the prophet, delivers this message from God. And he does so skillfully uh, with this parable. Uh, this man, he's poor, he has this sheep that he loves, right? Excuse me, it's a lamb, so baby, baby sheep that he absolutely loves, like a daughter to him. And he cares deeply for this, for this lamb that sleeps on his pillow, you know. And so then this rich man comes into town and needs to feed his guests. So he steals the lamb, murders it, cooks it, eats it. It's distressing. And as Nathan tells it, David's sitting in his throne getting all hot and bothered about it, right? The way we all do at someone else's uh, missteps. So David's getting all righteous and self-indignant and Nathan finishes and David's like, who is that? They deserve to die. They had no pity. And they got to repay fourfold. And he's leaning forward, you know, kingly, smiting, ready at the ready to go, and Nathan just kind of stands there, centers himself because really this could be his last moment if this all goes badly, and looks David in the eye and calmly says, you are the man. And I imagine there's a long pause, and David doesn't move. And Nathan begins this kind of horrible litany of all the tragedy that's going to befall David's personal family and really the people he governs as a result of this tragic, willful, horrifying act that David has done. And as Nathan speaks, I imagine David leans back in his chair and closes his eyes, and something about him shrinks just a little bit, and Nathan finishes. And it's a moment that almost mirrors what Nathan did. And David kind of centers himself, looks Nathan in the eye, and says, I have sinned against the Lord. And the truth is that we all intentionally, unintentionally hurt one another. It's just true about life that it's a given that to be in another relationship with just even one other person, let alone offices and organizations and churches, that to be in relationship, it's a given that there will be human relationship breakages. There will be tears. And, but what's not a given is how we respond to it. And so David is this kind of model 
of what a response looks like. But before I get into that, I want to do like the equivalent of reading and like a footnote, like a very important footnote. And it's this, that what David does is abhorrent. There is, he offers no mitigation for it and neither should we. Unfortunately, history has. There's been a lot of blame the victim, like it was all Bathsheba's fault. Uh, no. This is entirely and absolutely David's doing. And when I talk about human breakages of relationship in this sermon, I'm talking about the kind of human breakages that almost seem banal in their existence, right? But they're not. It's the outburst of anger at another person. It's the sarcastic comments that wheedle and wheedle away at someone. It's belittling the other person. It's ignoring a person, shunning a person, the gossip about a person. You know what I'm talking about because they happen to all of us. And at some time, we've perpetrated some of all of them. It's painful, but it's true. What David does is beyond that. What David does is abusive and horrible. And it does no dignity to the woman involved. And what he does is actually warrant of a court case. If it were in today's context, there are legal redress for that. And so, if something like that is happening, this sermon is not about putting up with abuse. So if verbal or neglect or any other kind of abuse is happening, this sermon is not about that. There are legal redresses for that. People need to leave that relationship and get help. I'm talking about the other category of relationship breakages. Are we on page? We're good. We know where we're at. All right. <laughs> I don't want so we could say then that David's a terrible model, right? And he is. But he makes it into scripture. And I think it's always important to remember scripture is written by people, written by a community, oral tradition here about people who often don't get it right, who really epically mess it up. David, God's anointed, the best king without contest in Israelite history, perpetrates a horrible act. And yet, when Nathan shows up and says, you are the man, I think it requires of David a lot of courage and an opening of his heart to be able to say, I have sinned. It's not an easy thing to say. And he doesn't try to get out of the consequences. The consequences are horrible. That child loses its life. And next week, coming to a theater near you next week, um, you know, his whole family enacts a rebellion. And it's, it's bad. And David has to live with the consequences of it. But when push comes to shove, he owns the truth. And as someone a few centuries later and a couple books later in scripture says, the truth will set you free. It's only by naming the truth and taking it into himself in confession that David opens the possibility that anything could be made right. Now, I want to believe somewhere that he goes and confesses his truth to Bathsheba. I don't know. It's not there. I hope so. Because confessing to the harmed person matters. But David does confess to God. And if tradition is right, Then he sings what becomes Psalm 51. If you are so inclined, it's on page 656 in that Red Book of Common Prayer. But it starts out, my transgressions are always before me. I've sinned. I've been caught in sin my entire life. David makes this confession. He names what's true about himself. But the psalm moves from naming what's true to then seeking mercy and forgiveness. Hold me in your mercy. Don't let your steadfast love depart from me. Remake my heart. Change me. Because what David knows is that that is possible with God. And see, no one likes a sin sermon, right? I mean, like, do I delight in giving them? No, no. But here's the thing. If we all look at our lives, and we look at our communities, and we look at the culture we live in, it's undeniable that human relationships are breaking all the time. And it's painful. And it hurts our lives, and it hurts our communities. And yet, unless we're able to name the truth and accept the truth in just the corners where we have influence, nothing will ever change. Healing is only possible when we admit the truth about it. And what David knows, too, is there's actually a better path. That in making his confession, he opens his heart for God to come in and remake it. To transfigure it. To grow love in it. Whatever metaphor works for you. 
that the Holy Spirit will come in and be able to make him less prone to harming other people. And that's really what the heart of our faith is about. It's about a God who loves us so much, he came to earth to die on a cross to forgive us forever. And to remake us and remake us and remake us and forgive us and forgive us and forgive us until that day when we're made whole in the unending kingdom of God. But until then, it seems to me we can model what that looks like now and how we treat one another and accept what's ours and open our hearts to setting ourselves free by owning our mistakes, by owning our wrong, by making them right with the people around us and having the humility to invite God's mercy into our lives, to invite the remaking, to be changed forever. And I truly believe if we did that in our relationships, and we fostered that in our organizations and communities, it's actually an Archimedean point to move the world. That by modeling that, we could actually change something about how hearts are open, about how forgiveness is possible. And even when forgiveness isn't possible between people, David reminds us that God's forgiveness is limitless. That God's mercy always holds us, no matter what it is we've done. And that God's steadfast love is ours, now and forever.